thank you very much for that intro. And I appreciate all you guys being here. I know this is right after the lunch hour, so I'm going to try to keep you guys awake. Um, but what I really wanted to bring to you today was specifically information on something that we as veterinarians really have a hard time uh, dealing with, which is soft tissue injury. And it's sort of that big unknown, that gray area of lameness um, that we typically have a hard time localizing. So I was hoping to bring a few pointers uh, to everyone to hopefully help out in your own practice and deal with some of these injuries that we see. So to get started, uh, what we're going to discuss today, first and foremost, all of the boring stuff we're going to get out of the way, which is defining what actually soft tissue is and the structures that we're, we're dealing with. We're going to look at a couple of gait patterns to help to understand what we're looking at when we, when we watch a dog walk and trot, uh, try to determine lameness. And then we're going to look at some of the soft tissue injuries that are commonly dealt with, not just with athletes, but pet dogs as well how we deal with treatment and the different modalities we use as well. So to start off with defining what we're talking about when we think about soft tissue, um, we're defining things like sprains and strains, which is sometimes hard to go back and forth and understand exactly how we're defining that. A sprain is dealing with a ligament where a strain is dealing with a tendon. And the way I always remember that is simply the ST and strain T for tendon. So that helps us to understand exactly the structure that we're dealing with and how we define that when we're specifically when we're talking to clients and surgeons as well. Um, in terms of the type of injury that they're dealing with. So for uh, a ligament or a tendon, um, tendon specifically can deal with acute and chronic types of injury. And in a tendon, we know that as tendonitis being more of an acute inflammation, um, typically resulting in local inflammation around the muscle tendon junction or within the tendon itself. Whereas a tendinosis is defined as more of a chronic degeneration. So this is when the patient has dealt with a tendinitis, and now that has turned into more of a chronic inflammation over time that has not been dealt with. And now that tendons, uh, collagen fibers are dealing with more of an overuse type injury. So that's how we define the difference between uh, tendinitis and tendinosis, acute versus chronic. For tendon injuries, we look at first degree through third degree strains. And essentially think in your mind like an Achilles tear. So you're running down the road, you're training for your marathon, you hit a, hit a little hole and you might torque your ankle. You come home, you ice it for a 20 minutes, you rest for a few days, and that inflammation goes away. That would be considered more of a first degree type strain. Whereas a third degree would be an actual complete rupture of that tendon. So that's just a, a way to manage the severity of that injury. Ligament is sort of the same way. We also grade it one through three, where we have a few collagen fibers that are disrupted initially, like a collateral type ligament. Um, of an ankle or a knee and moving all the way into a grade three where that ligament is completely torn and creating a lot of instability in that joint. So that would be more like an extensor uh, tendinopathy or rupture around the carpus area where the dog is has lost complete stability in that joint. Looking at muscle injuries, we can go anywhere from soreness to stiffness, something we all endure when we decide to go back to the gym after six months of not doing exercise. And usually a few days later, we can barely move because those muscles tighten up, especially those that have not been worked in a long time. And that can lead to things like prolonged cramping or spasms. And spasms essentially are just painful muscle contractions um, that happen when that muscle gets stressed. So those spasms can become very prolonged and actually lead to decreased extensibility, decreased range of motion. Then we have things like contusions, which is a direct impact to the muscle. So that would be something hitting the muscle directly and causing localized bleeding. And then certainly we, we all know about rupture 
just like a football player that's coming off the line and getting hit by another player at the same time, we have that muscle that is in contraction as the player is moving and also uh, being hit um, and forcing an antagonist muscle against that muscle to actually create a tear in it. So that's where we have full rupture within the, the muscle belly itself. And then of course we deal with weakness, which is muscles that have been either not used for a long period of time, post-surgical patients, uh, certainly one of the top issues with them, as well as uh, injuries that require immobilization or uh, neurologic type patients that are unable to use the muscles properly. So weakness uh, prolong can also be caused by prolonged muscle spasm, like we, we talked about earlier, where the muscle can spasm over a period of time, causing that muscle to become highly fatigued and weak. The last soft tissue structure we're going to talk about is fascia. And this is something that we don't think about normally as soft tissue, but it actually can cause a lot of issues specifically in trying to rehabilitate patients after surgery, because the fascia is a layer of connective tissue that essentially covers the muscle bellies. And so when we injure that, either by cutting it during surgery to get to a certain area, a, a joint like in an FHO, um, or it has it suffers direct trauma from tearing or direct trauma to the actual muscle, uh, we can have areas that become now trigger points. So this is when your massage therapist comes up and sticks their thumb in your in your shoulder and you want to jump off the table. So hitting these points of localized inflammation in the fascia, um, there's a lot of nerve endings there and they, it, they can produce a lot of pain. So with the pain, that's where we get the decreased mobility in our patients because they don't want to move that limb when that muscle is in spasm and super, super tight. So now we're gonna go into some gait patterns that I think are important for us to understand the best way to diagnose injury. One of them is the trot. And the trot is something that I use all the time to help differentiate between one limb or another. And the reason why is because the trot is the, the, the most efficient gait for the dog. And what I mean by that is it allows them to use all of their energy to move forward. It's the only gait where the forelimbs and the hind limbs are not assisted in the other, the contralateral limb in bearing weight. So in other words, when the right front is hitting the ground, the left hind is hitting the ground at the same time, which allows for only two feet on opposite ends of the body to be on the ground at the same time. And this is what helps us localize which limb is actually suffering uh, from pain. So I'm going to show you an example of this, and one in regular motion and one in slow motion, just to give you an idea of how we're defining it. So you can see as the dog bears weight, it's the opposite limb, right front, left hind, left front, right hind. Very smooth, efficient gait for a dog normally. It's very difficult for a dog that is dealing with pain um, to mask that in this gait pattern. In fact, many dogs that have an injury have a hard time maintaining a trot and they can end up changing their gait pattern uh, to make it easier for them. And one of those gait patterns we can see regularly in an, in an abnormal type scenario is called a pace. And the pace is where both limbs on the same side of the body are actually moving forward at the same time and hitting the ground at the same time. So the center of gravity of the dog is moving from side to side, and it's a very inefficient gait for them to actually move forward. This is considered an abnormal gait, typically. Um, some dogs have been inadvertently uh, trained in this gait pattern without the owner's knowledge. Um, but most of the time, this is a gait pattern that we see when the dog has, has some discomfort or has an injury that it's compensating for. So this example here in slow motion shows this dog who actually has lumbosacral disease um, exhibiting you can see the right side of the body advancing forward and then the left. 
So that's a great example of what you would see normally. Typically, this is something that a dog will uh, only show when they're when they're uncomfortable. But I've had some dogs that come out of an injury um, using this gait because it's more comfortable for them. And we've actually had to retrain the gait into a normal trot uh, using things like cavalettis, where they're having to walk over uh, obstacles at certain distances and decreasing the distance between those obstacles to help them reestablish a normal gait. I'm going to play that one more time for you guys. Okay. All right. So how do we recognize abnormal gait? What I want to do is take you through my normal orthopedic exam and how I try to figure this out um, all the way from a sitting exam into the gait itself. So the first thing I do is look at the dog in a standing position. And I'm essentially always looking for asymmetry, no matter what we're doing, no matter how we're examining the dog in a stand or, or a trot or a walk, I'm looking for asymmetry. So in a stand, those things can look like offloading of a limb. Their head position can change from one side to the other. Their paw placement can be different from one side of the body to the other, and even tail position. So in a stand, this is a good example. One of those is forelimb offloading. This dog is standing in front of me, the right forelimb, you can see the toes are pointed straight toward the camera. The left forelimb, however, the paw is abducted slightly. So this is a way to help tell if a dog is loading fully through the forelimb or trying to offload a little bit and compensate. Um, obviously this is a border collie, so you can see the hind end is somewhat cow hocked as well or torquing out away from the body, but that's normal and natural for this dog's uh, breed. The forelimbs, however, should be nice and straight. So this dog ended up having a medial shoulder instability causing pain. And you can see a very subtle sign, but this is something that can help you determine what leg may be the issue. And in a situation like this, if I see this at a stand, I'll ask the dog to take a few steps forward and stop into stand again and make sure that I'm consistently seeing the asymmetry, um, that it wasn't just the way the dog stopped in that particular moment. This is more of what I deal with uh, looking at retrievers in the field. So a lot of things that are obscuring our view, um, like high, high grass and high cover. But I love this picture because it gives you an example of something that's really subtle that can help you even in an exam room. And this is looking at the carpal pad. So you can see on the right forelimb, the carpal pad is lower than the one on the left. And even though the, the paw is in the shadow, you can get an impression of how you could see a little bit more of the metacarpal pad from the back than you can on the right. So again, a very subtle way to determine that the dog is not loading as much weight through that left forelimb as they are the right. Okay, so next we go from a standing exam to a sitting test. And this is where we're looking for the dog to get into a sit from a stand and then come back into a stand from a sit. We're observing the transition of weight from front to back. So obviously we're, we're looking for sloppy sits, dogs that are throwing legs out or abducting away, um, but we're also looking for those subtle changes in weight shifting. This is a little bit of an extreme example, but it sort of drives the point home that we're looking for these abnormalities and asymmetry. So this is more likely what we would see, a dog with a very subtle uh, transition of weight. So you can see that the left stifle in this dog is abducted away from the body. And this is the way for the dog to not place full weight through that side, but also not completely flex that stifle, which 
may be causing the dog discomfort. So this is a way for them to have what I call a lazy sit or a sloppy sit, um, but also might be helping us determine that this is the leg that could be affected. In another example, this is a dog who is about eight to 10 weeks post-op TPLO. So this is a dog that has a very normal knee now. The knee has been repaired. There's no pain in the stifle, but this dog has simply not been able to build the quadricep and hamstring and adductors back appropriately enough to help his legs stay in position squarely underneath his body. So this is not a dog that is suffering from pain or injury, but simply lack of muscle to help them sit squarely. So these are things to consider uh, when you are looking at dogs in a sit. Again, very subtle sign, um, almost completely square, but just needing a little bit more help with the adductor. Okay, so now we've seen the dog at a stand and at a sit. Now I want the dog to walk and trot. And typically I'll start with the dog on lead walking to, toward me and also away from me. Uh, if I don't see much on that, I'm gonna ask them to do the same thing walking in front of me from side to side. So right to left, I'm seeing both sides of the dog. And I'm also gonna do the same exact thing in a trot because sometimes you can see lameness at a walk um, and sometimes you can't. And that's where that trot gait comes in and helps us determine better what's going on. The other thing I might do specifically if I'm looking at potentially a forelimb lameness is circling the dog from, from right to left. So I'll start with a very wide, big circle to one in one direction, right or left, doesn't matter. And then I'll turn the dog and do, do the same thing in the opposite direction. The inside leg of that circle is the leg that is going to take on most of the stress and the pressure in that circling movement. So if you have a, say, a right forelimb lameness, you may bring that out more and exhibit that uh, discomfort more in that circle versus a dog that's just walking straight toward you or away from you. What I recommend to clients all the time and even veterinarians is to use slow motion video because it really helps you determine specifically in these subtle lamenesses um, what you might not be able to see in real time. So I use slow motion all the time, even though this is what I do for a living, I watch gate all the time, but I still think uh, in those subtle cases, it makes a huge difference. Okay, so soft tissue lameness specifically, just a few uh, hints, if you will, things that I've seen over the years that help me determine soft tissue versus joint. This doesn't go for every injury, but these are some things that might help. And one of those things is a shortened stride. So you don't typically always get, unless it's very severe, a three-legged lameness like you would say in a cruciate rupture. So for soft tissue uh, injury, many times you'll see simply a shortened stride. And we call this the swing phase of the dog. The swing phase is when the limb is pulled off the ground and advanced forward as the dog is walking or trotting. And usually that swing phase, again, we're comparing from right to left, is going to be shortened on one side versus the other if that is the affected limb. Slow motion video helps determine that as well. So usually in soft tissue lameness, again, we're going to see more of a weight bearing uh, lameness. And usually you're going to see um, in a forelimb lameness, something we call down on sound, which is um, an easy way to determine forelimb lameness, specifically in a slow motion video. You're going to see the dog's head uh, go down towards the ground as the limb that is unaffected or sound hits the ground. And think about that in terms of weight bearing. So if I am comfortable on a limb, I'm going to be okay with putting all of my weight through that limb, which is going to simply bring my head down toward the ground as I'm about to bear weight. In the limb that I am injured on or is uncomfortable, I'm going to try to pull my weight away from that leg. So as I go to place the, that injured leg on the ground, I'm going to pull my head away to take the weight off of that limb. And that's what we mean by down on sound. 
I'm going to show you an example here. I love this video because it's very subtle. It's very difficult to determine which leg is, is injured here, but I'm going to show you the slow motion version here and try to determine amongst yourselves uh, which leg you think is affected. Remember the down on sound. Okay, so I can't pull the audience here, but um, this dog is actually lame on its left forelimb, even though as it's walking toward you, it looks like the right forelimb has a shortened stride. Um, you'll see that in the slow motion, the dog's head is actually coming up away from the ground as it's placing the left forelimb. And we'll see a video later in the presentation specifically showing the stretch on this dog and sh uh, we'll show you the difference in the comfort level from right to left. I'm going to show this video one more time. So this is a left forelimb lame lameness. Okay. This next video is the gracilis myopathy. So this is a soft tissue injury to the hind leg now. And you can see this is almost like a circumduction of the right hind where that right hind paw is being, as the dog is advancing forward, is actually placed in the midline um, of the dog. So this is where the stifle cannot fully extend. Uh, neither can the tarsus. This is a soft tissue injury that essentially is um, uh, fibrosis of the muscle tissue. So a thickening, almost like scarring of the muscle tissue, very difficult to deal with. Um, but this is a great pathognomonic gate for what we call gracilis myopathy. You can see it's almost as if the dog has a rubber band attached to its tarsus, um, that kind of quick snap that the leg undergoes as the dog advances the limb forward. Shepherds are predisposed to this injury, unfortunately. Okay, so some of the common injuries that I see, um, both in athletes and in pet dogs that you may also see in hospital, one of them being bicep tenosynovitis. So this is something that we all probably have seen and dealt with, may not have known that. Um, but again, it can be a very gray area because this injury can be extremely acute, um, extremely intermittent, all the way to the level of uh, chronically, a dog being chronically lame. So what this involves is both the muscle um, the biceps brachii muscle and the tendon itself. What makes this so complex is that the bicep is responsible for not only extending and stabilizing the shoulder, but also flexing the elbow. So usually what we're going to see here is more of a uh, repetitive type strain injury. Um, this happens a lot with dogs that uh, make tight turns, quick turns, and they overstretch that muscle. Uh, they cause a little bit of tearing within it and it causes a localized inflammation. Unfortunately, if this goes on, it can become more of a repetitive chronic strain and actually degenerate the tendon and weaken the tendon itself. Usually there's very minimal, minimal blood supply to tendons and the tendon sheath. So that, what's, that is what makes this injury very difficult to treat because we have a lack of blood flow innately in the tendon itself. Um, so again, this is something that we probably deal with a lot more than we know, uh, because dogs can be very, very subtly lame, and the lameness can last from anywhere from one day to many, many months. The clinical presentation I usually see in a very acute uh, bicep 
tendonitis or tenosynovitis is lameness that is worse after work or exercise. So this is a dog that runs across the field and comes back actively lame. Um, the tendon can be really thick on palpation and it can also be painful on direct palpation. The um, actual stretch that we, that we undergo, I'm gonna show you later in a video called the bicep stretch, is where we flex the shoulder and extend the elbow at the same time. And many times if the bicep is affected, we're gonna get pain uh, on that stretch in and of itself. The dog is gonna pull the leg back as we go into that stretch. Sometimes if it's uh, more subtle, we go, we take the dog into the bicep stretch and actually palpate over the tendon at the same time, looking for a reaction. This is where we're seeing that shortened forelimb stride, not necessarily a non-weight bearing uh, injury. This could be a very subtle weight bearing injury. Sometimes we'll get lucky and we'll see a bony avulsion uh, radiographically, but most, most often we're not gonna see changes on radiographs for this acute presentation. So how do we treat this? This is a situation where we wanna decrease the inflammation quickly, but we also do not wanna take blood supply away from this area for an extended period. So I may do a few days of an anti-inflammatory for the initial inflammation and, and uh, specifically the pain, but I'm usually not extending that beyond a three-day period. I'll try laser therapy and some range of motion after laser to help keep everything loose. And I might ice the area for 10, 15 minutes for the first couple of days. But the whole concept of dealing with this acute inflammation is to decrease that inflammation and pain. But again, uh, we're not looking for any long-term anti-inflammatory component. And I think that's a big thing I see um, general practitioners make a mistake about is they keep the dog on an anti-inflammatory a little bit too long, uh, which takes a ability for that tendon to heal. In the chronic presentation, this can be a little bit more complex. So this is a dog that may have an intermittent lameness, may come in this month for a few days lame and then fine for several months and might present again in six months with the same leg lameness. Um, but we're not really sure what's going on because the dog seems to recover with minimal rest and treatment. So this is when that tendon now has uh, gone through a process of degeneration. So those will be talked about earlier, tendinosis versus tendinitis those changes have become now chronic and the body is trying to throw down scar tissue to deal with those changes in the tendon. Um, and you're gonna get things like muscle spasms along with it. And even over time, a lot of muscle atrophy, which is gonna help you determine how chronic this issue really is. The other thing that, that I see a lot, and this is a, um, something I think is missed, is pain around the elbow. Because remember what we said about the bicep, was that it also helps to extend the elbow. And so the insertion point of the bicep is very close to the joint capsule. And so when we palpate over the insertion, many times we confuse that for elbow pain, but it's actually the bicep that is tight and angry. So that's one thing to keep in mind when you're palpating over joints, that that bicep insertion is very close to that elbow. And if you're getting that pain, make sure you're um, examining the rest of the elbow joint. So the, the lateral aspect as well to help you determine if it's true capsular pain or tendon. On radiographs, uh, many times we can see actual mineralization within the tendon or sclerosis within the bicipital groove if this has been going on for several, several months. So this is that dog that we saw earlier to try to determine which uh, leg was lame. You can see the right forelimb here as a very normal bicep stretch. So we're taking the dog, and we'll play that one more time. Shoulder flexion, elbow extension. What's the shoulder? Semi elbow. And now we're going to see the lame leg.
So that is as far as she can extend that elbow out. The dog is restricting that stretch. This dog had severe medial shoulder disease. This stretch can be done in standing or laying down. It's whatever is the most comfortable for the dog and the veterinarian. Okay, so how do we treat chronic uh, tendinoses? Typically, what I recommend is at this point, we know the tendon has undergone degeneration in some, some degree. So the best thing to do is get an idea of how bad that really is. So we know how to treat it and what to treat it with. One of those things would be using diagnostic ultrasound. And that's a great way to look at the actual fiber patterns of the tendon, determine the severity of it, look for core lesions within the tendon, but also look at the other structures around it. The supraspinatus tendon, which can cause impingement and pain over the bicep simply because they live so close together that when one is enlarged or injured, it can make the other one uh, very unhappy. So looking at those other structures, also looking at medial shoulder structures and the synovium itself, how much a, a potential fluid or increase in fluid is within the joint or if there's fluid around the tendon itself. So all of these things help us determine what we're actually dealing with in terms of severity. Um, another way to diagnose is also using MRI. So now that we've determined we have a chronic issue in the bicep, we want to reinitiate that inflammatory process. So the body has done everything it can to stop the inflammation, which is good in a way, but unfortunately, because tendons need blood supply to heal, when we stop, uh, when the body stops allowing that to happen, the tendon can no longer heal in a proper manner. So we need to reinitiate that process. And we can use things like therapeutic ultrasound, um, shockwave therapy, and also ultrasound guided PRP directly into those areas of damage uh, to help reinitiate that process. And then of course, after treatment, we are initiating a rehabilitation program to help strengthen the muscles around those tendons. So the bicep, the tricep, the deltoid, um, certainly the entire body, but specifically those muscles around that shoulder joint to help the dog recover. I'm gonna show you a few of those exercises here just to keep you awake. So this is an example of what I was talking about before with pacing, uh, Cavaletti walking. So this is helping to improve range of motion. It's also a great strengthening exercise and proprioceptive exercise. And we start obviously with these cones uh, about body length apart and bring them closer together and increase the height of the Cavaletti. Um, as we are rehabilitating and increasing difficulty of the exercises. This is a figure eight with a Cavaletti. So now we are dealing with rotation, balance. Again, really great proprioceptive exercise. Moving on to balance exercises. So using air mattresses or fit paw discs, balance discs. Very difficult exercise on an air mattress, uh, but this dog was excellent at this particular exercise. So next, moving into one of the things I see a lot in field dogs, and that is iliopsoas strain. This is a muscle I think that is certainly underdiagnosed as well as overdiagnosed in terms of injury and injury severity. Uh, this muscle is actually composed of, of two, the iliacus and the psoas, psoas major. It originates underneath the lumbar vertebra, and it inserts on the lesser trochanter of the femur. It's responsible for hip flexion and advancing the limb forward. So there's a lot of components here, a lot of activities that can cause this muscle to, to become angry and injured, strained. Um, most of the time I see this muscle very upset due to compensatory 
problems. So in other words, if a dog has a cruciate injury, the opposite iliopsoas might get very tight and sore uh, simply because of compensation for that other side. So for actual strain, when the fibers of the muscle have been torn, um, we see this as anywhere from a very subtle lameness to an actual three-legged lameness. So these dogs can be extremely painful. And I think they are often misdiagnosed as cruciates because of this level of lameness that can be seen. So you can have a dog holding the leg up um, in complete spasm of that muscle and looking as though this is a joint injury. Things that predispose to this injury, like I said before, surgery, obviously, compensation, things like patellar luxation, where one side um, is affected and the other side is not, and hip dysplasia also can put more stress on, on this muscle. This also may result acutely from an actual injury, such as a splain injury, a dog slipping on a floor, legs abducting out from underneath it, and actually causing an acute tearing of this muscle. Diagnostics to help with this would be that would be ultrasound, diagnostic ultrasound and MRI. Normally we don't see a ton on either one of these, but it like, like I said, if we have a severe injury, we can see the tearing um, specifically with these modalities. Presentation of this, we normally see a shortened stride but we also see a circumduction. And I'm gonna show you a very specific video of this where the dog is throwing the leg out in a circular motion away from the body. And this happens during the swing phase. So advancing the limb forward and also throwing it out away from the body. On exam, you're gonna see pain upon extension of the hip with abduction and internal rotation. And I'll show you an example of that also. Um, the actual stretch that we use to help determine this injury. Pain and spasm directly over the muscle belly um, and also the insertion area, although you can't palpate it directly, you can palpate over where that insertion is uh, near the lesser trochanter. And if you get spasm and pain there, that will help you also determine that that is the issue. I will say that this is a very, very sensitive area. So it requires minimal pressure digitally uh, to create a, a response from the dog. So be very careful when you're palpating specifically at the insertion because you can over uh, or misdiagnose this simply because we use too much pressure in exam. Sometimes we get lucky on radiographs. We can actually see mineralization when this becomes a chronic repetitive issue. Um, on a, on a VD view, VD pelvic view, we can see mineralization uh, within the tendon around the insertion point near the lesser trochanter. So this is an example of an iliopsoas strain that looks very, very similar to a cruciate injury. And I'll play this a couple times. So again, you're watching for a shortened stride, but also a very subtle circumduction of the leg. Most of the time, this is going to be a weight-bearing lameness. So treatment of this. In the acute phases, I like to use a muscle relaxant. I specifically go with methocarbamol or robaxin at very high doses. Um, so usually 14 to 21 days for acute injury helps that muscle calm down and recover. I'm also using things like laser and ultrasound therapy to, again, help blood flow and decrease inflammation quickly. The biggest thing, though, with this injury more than anything else is not allowing the patient to jump uh, even one step because most of the time you get them feeling better. And even after a couple of days, they look like there's nothing wrong. And the first time they go to jump into the truck or on the bed, the uh, inflammation returns and you're right back where you started. So no jumping is a important restriction and certainly leash walk only. For the chronic cases, again, this is more where we see the compensatory issues. Um, a resistance to jumping is one of those things that can also guide you in this direction. So again, remember that hip extension 
um, is what this muscle is responsible for. So they're going to not feel comfortable jumping uh, when this muscle is, is injured. So in the chronic cases, we're using things like heat and again, bringing blood flow back in to help heal. So things like shockwave therapy, stretching, and also again, strengthening to make sure the muscles around this muscle can help support it in the future. So this is an example of the iliopsoas stretch, but it's also the way to help diagnose this. You're going to uh, see me extend the leg back behind the dog. So we're extending the hip, toes down, pointed toward the ground. You're going to see my hand grab the paw. And as I'm grabbing the paw, I'm actually internally rotating or turning the toes toward the, uh, toward the dog. And upon that rotation is when you will get the reaction if the psoas is compromised. Like I said, it's, it can be a very, very subtle reaction. This dog has a normal exam here. So I'm going to play it one more time. The most important part of this stretch is to make sure that you do not overextend the hip. So the way you do that is bring those toes down, almost touching the ground, internally rotate the paw. And if that iliopsoas is uncomfortable, you're going to get an immediate reaction. These are some of the exercises we use to help strengthen the psoas. So I'm looking to strengthen the internal, um, the adductor, so the um, internal muscles of the hind limb. The, these exercises like sidestepping, use those muscles specifically. So we go from one side to the other, never just to one side, but sidestepping is a great tool to be able to strengthen those muscles. Also Heel. backwards walking. Heel. We help build those hamstrings. Heel. Heel, 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 here. Helps to have a dog who knows no. how to heal, obviously. Heel, heel, heel. Good. Squats, sit, stands. Helping to build those quadriceps and hamstrings, again, supporting the iliopsoas. This, uh, this particular exercise, this dog was well advanced in her recovery. So she was performing the sit stand on uh, an air mattress to increase the level of, di of difficulty. Okay, so last injury we're gonna discuss is Achilles tendon. This is probably one that we've seen more often than, than the others. Um, this can be caused by an acute trauma, such as a fall or an actual wound. Um, I've had a couple of cases of uh, dogs that have gone in for grooming and the tendon has actually been severed by the blade um, or the, uh, the scissor. So these are things that can be very, very acute or extremely chronic. And usually the chronic degeneration of this tendon is due to repetitive stress over time. The Achilles is responsible for extension of the tarsal joint and flexion of the digits. And many times um, we see this in, in patients, large breed patients like Labradors and Dobermans who are overrepresented with this. Things we know predispose, uh, metabolically speaking, Cushing's and diabetes, and certainly dogs that are overweight. So clinical presentation for dogs with acute tears, you're normally gonna see a extreme palpable swelling over the calcaneus itself. And usually in these acute cases, the dogs are extremely painful. So they're, they're typically non-weight bearing where the chronic presentation is going to be more of a thickening versus a palpable swelling. So a thickening around the calcaneus uh, where the body has tried to throw down to uh, scar tissue or fibrosis around that area to help stabilize it and heal the tears. And you're going to see a degree of potential hyperflexion of the hawk 
depending on the severity or um, the amount of tearing, which tendons are actually torn um, over time. This is normally a weight bearing presentation. And sometimes we can see a stance, we call it a, a bear claw stance, essentially, where the, the toes are almost, they almost look like the toenails are touching the ground and they can't extend. So um, this is where the dog over time has had a, a large amount of inflammation. The body has done everything it can to try to stabilize it, but unfortunately, we have a great amount of instability around the joint. And this is a, this is a great example of that instability. You can see the hyperflexion at the tarsus of this dog in the left hind. Some dogs can be completely plantigrade to the point where all of the tendons have been evolved. And this is a standing picture of that hyperflexion. So this dog had a superficial digital flexor avulsion. Uh, the deep digital was still intact, but she had a significant degree of instability. So diagnostics for this. First and foremost, we always take radiographs. We can sometimes see that soft tissue swelling in the acute phase over the calcaneus, even on radiographs. And many times we can see an actual avulsion or bone fragment off the calcaneus if it's been a traumatic injury. In chronic cases, you can see mineralization within the tendon on radiographs as well. But typically diagnostic ultrasound or MRI are the best ways to determine the severity of injury. I specifically like diagnostic ultrasound, not just because it's minimally invasive, does not require anesthesia, but I feel like you can get a better sense of some of the small tears that you might may not pick up on. Um, seeing MRI miss uh, quite a bit on these uh, specifically chronic tendinopathies in the Achilles. So multiple tendons can be involved here. Uh, again, ultrasound is definitely the best way to determine the severity. So for non-surgical cases, I usually put these dogs in a tarsal brace, and this is to support the joint, but also to take load off that tendon. So what we're looking to do is put the hawk in a hyperextended position to take full pressure off that tendon. And then over time, as, as we're going through the rehab process, we're going to load that tendon to a greater degree uh, as that tendon is healing. So in the acute phases, we're, we're icing early on. We're using things like laser and ultrasound to help with inflammation. Um, sometimes I'll use a topical anti-inflammatory, which is DMSO gel with some lidocaine uh, infused into it, and that'll help with the local inflammation. And then we may do some ultrasound guided PRP injections and shockwave when we're dealing with very small tears, very small lesions that are non-surgical. And again, that's helping to reintroduce that process, that initial, initial inflammatory process to help heal it. This is an example of a brace with a thermoplast. So this is a dog that has a 30% uh, tear in the superficial digital. And so we have placed a brace and a thermoplast, which gives a little bit more rigid support. So we can actually change the amount of load on that tendon as the tendon heals. And we're, how we're determining tendon healing is repeating that diagnostic ultrasound to look at the changes as the tendon moves forward in the process. Okay, so just a few uh, slides on the actual modalities we talked about for treatment. One of those being therapeutic laser. So I have a class 3B laser, which is essentially a, a mechanism that uses light energy. It's absorbed at the level of the cell and it increases ATP production. So this is usually an infrared light spectrum that provides energy to the cell, but it actually helps accelerate healing. And the nice thing about laser is it has a cumulative effect. So the more treatments you, you get, um, the better the tissue responds over time. It's also a painless procedure and not, not invasive in any way. 
main benefits, I just gave you an idea here of increasing cell metabolism. Uh, for us, speaking specifically to soft tissue injury, it increases collagen synthesis. So that's big when it comes to soft tissue healing. We also have known it to help with bone healing um, and certainly introduction and formation of new capillaries, which is where that increase in blood flow helps. Therapeutic ultrasound. So this is a modality that uses sound waves and vibration specifically of sound waves to help reduce pain and inflammation. It also increases blood flow like the laser. Um, however, it actually improves collagen organization. So this is something we will use specifically in tendon injuries to actually help realign those collagen fibers and improve uh, the ability for that tendon to heal. So we're using this in muscle tears, tendinopathies, and like I said before, in those cases of trigger points and spasm, it's great to help decrease uh, those areas of, of spasm. I often use this in combination with laser uh, or other modalities, and it's definitely one of my go-tos for soft tissue. Shockwave therapy. So I would say overall, uh, this, has, this modality has changed the way I'm able to treat soft tissue. And the biggest uh, point to that is the improvement in the inflammation and pain, but also the acceleration of healing. So I can get the amount of healing with one treatment of shockwave versus multiple with laser and ultrasound. And that has what that is really what's turned my practice around in terms of treating soft tissue with this modality. It does a lot of other great things like bone healing and wound healing, uh, but I use it specifically for soft tissue and joint. This is high energy sound wave therapy, and it's going to stimulate and release growth factors, reducing inflammation and increasing blood flow. There was a great study done in, uh, in Seattle at the Seattle Veterinary Specialist Hospital specifically looking at bicep or supraspinatus tendinopathies. And just within one to three treatments, uh, the, the degree of, of healing and, and improvement was significant. The great thing about this treatment is it's very quick. It's usually under five, 10 minutes. And uh, PulseVet has come up with a new trode that allows for uh, minimal sedation at best. In fact, most of my patients do not require any sedation unless they are sound sensitive. Um, and usually we're looking at one to three sessions. So versus laser and ultrasound where I've, I had to treat for many, many weeks to deal with specifically chronic soft tissue problems. This has really turned that around and allowed me to um, treat these, these patients in a very short, short amount of time. <clears throat> 